All right, we're going to get started. Welcome to the 2013 series of Medical Education Grand Round sponsored by the Department of Medical Education and the Institute for Medical Education. If you haven't uh, seen Anna's calendar that she sent out, please pick up one right there. This year, Grand Rounds will be held in a couple of different venues to uh, enhance our ability to videotape and broadcast this eventually. So it will require taking a look at the uh, event and where we've moved to because we will not always be in this room. Um, this year's coverage is incredible. We have visitors coming and speakers from, from Sinai and our partners that really reflect uh, timely, innovative, practical, applicable topics in undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, continuing medical education, uh, community and multicultural affairs, global health, and student programs. We also have our invited AOA speaker who will be speaking at Medical Education Grand Rounds, and of course our Blue Ribbon winners from Medical Education Research Day. But I'm especially proud, actually, for today's presentation because this year we're gonna start a formal presentation by students. I think we all know here that students do some of the best work at Sinai and really reflect reflect, I think, the best of who we are. And today is absolutely a great example of that. So today we're going to hear from SC Rollhouse and Virginia Halpern Cohen. SC is a fourth year medical student applying for residency in general psychiatry. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Yeshiva University in Psychology and English Literature and then entered Mount Sinai through the Humanities and Medicine program in 2010. Uh, throughout her years at Sinai, Esty has been involved in various educational activities, including the Professional Development Advisory Group and Students for Students. She also founded the Mount Sinai School of Medicine Women's Network and served as a producer for the Vagina Monologues in 2012. Virginia Halpern Cohen is a second year medical student and she received her BA from Yale University and entered Mount Sinai also through the Humanities and Medicine program. Where is Dr. Case? There we go. <laughs> A testament. Virginia is involved in various student organizations. She is co-producing the Vagina Monologues in 2014. She co-leads the Maimonides Society, which is Mount Sinai's Jewish student group, and is running the Art of Anatomy figure drawing group. Virginia is also interested in teaching and is serving as a teaching assistant for several first-year classes. So it gives me great privilege to introduce two of our most outstanding students who are going to present to you on learning for the future leadership skills for medical students. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Crani. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for having us here. In this talk, we're gonna be discussing a curriculum that we designed and implemented this past June to teach leadership skills to year one medical students at Mount Sinai. Our curriculum was entitled, Learning for the Future, Leadership Skills for Medical Students. Before we begin, we'd just like to express our sincerest gratitude to you for having us present here at Grand Rounds. It's absolutely an honor to be asked to be here, and it's a testament to how innovative and flexible Sinai is, that not only do they have students presenting at Grand Rounds, but they've also been instrumental in helping us create this curriculum from uh, implementation to design and throughout. So thank you so much for that. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge two of our mentors who are here today, Dr. Rina Karani and Shashi Anand. Uh, Dr. Karani, thank you so much for helping us develop our idea encouraging us to stay grounded in the literature and to be systematic in the way that we developed our competencies and analyzed our data. Thank you, Dr. Karani. Uh, Shashi, it's really difficult for us to sum up what Shashi has meant to us um, for this project and to Virginia and myself personally. Shashi has served as a mentor and a confidant and has been our number one advocate throughout the entire process. So thank you so much, Shashi. Um, and there are also a lot of mentors uh, who are here today. A lot of individuals were involved with curricular design, and we'll go through them more by name. But we just want to thank you both for showing up here today and supporting us, and for supporting us throughout the entire curriculum. So thank you all so much. All right, so before we get started, I'm just going to take you guys through the learning objectives for today's presentation. So first, hopefully we will recognize the need for leadership training in undergraduate medical education. We will also identify components of successful educational leadership interventions. And finally, we will take you through um, our curriculum in more detail. So we will take you through the conceptual framework, design, content, assessment, and uh, some of the results from our pilot lead, uh, leadership curriculum. So just you know, a little bit of the outline of our presentation today. 
Uh, we're going to take you through some of the literature surrounding the need for leadership education and medical, uh, medical education. Um, we're going to take you through our curricular design, tell us a little bit, tell you guys a little bit where we were coming from when we were designing the curriculum, how we decided to um, choose the different parts of it. We're going to talk about the outcomes and some of the feedback and analysis that we got from students. And finally, we'll discuss um, some of the future directions that we see this leadership curriculum taking. Uh, so I'm sure people are familiar with this slide or slides like it. It's one of the scarier figures that we have representing the healthcare system and the status today. Um, it basically tells us that even adjusting for inflation, our healthcare costs have been steadily rising for the past several decades. The United States relative to other countries spends the largest percentage of its GDP on healthcare, about 17.6% in 2011. But the sad reality is that despite the fact that our system is by far and away one of the most uh, expensive systems, we're not providing the best quality of care. In the Commonwealth study of fir seven first world nations, the US ranks number seven last overall. And it's last in dimensions of access, patient safety, coordination, efficiency, and equity. The Institute of Medicine has called on increased physician leadership to help redesign the healthcare system for the 21st century in an effort to address the alarming disparity between the rising costs and quality of care. The Institute of Medicine has called for increased opportunities for physician leadership training as the number of physicians graduating with skills necessary to take on leadership roles remains insufficient given the overwhelming task. So why does the 21st century physician need to be a leader? We know that 21st century physicians are confronted with realities and complexities for which um, standard clinical training may no longer sufficiently prepare them. Uh, as previously mentioned, there's a crisis of cost, especially relative to the quality of care that we're delivering. Um, and you know, this is really where the word value comes in. So value refers to patient outcomes per dollar spent. So basically it means getting good outcomes as efficiently as possible. Um, so the modern physician really needs to be taught uh, to think along these lines and in order to be able to embrace the complexity of the healthcare system and hopefully become an agent of change within it. Um, and of course, physicians you know, are often called upon to be leaders within the, the system, but also to be part of effective teams. So physicians need to be able to uh, learn how to do that. Uh, so medical education was outlined in the 1910 Flexner Report, so traditional medical education as we think of it today. And so it's mostly clinical uh, as opposed to maybe uh, being more context-based and teaching students more about the context of the general healthcare system into which they're entering. Uh, it rewards autonomy and independence as opposed to focusing on some of the skills necessary for interdependence within clinical teams. It's focused in hospitals, which perhaps de-emphasizes some of the other modalities of healthcare delivery. Uh, it emphasizes treatment as opposed to prevention. Uh, we all know that. Uh, it lacks team learning and assessment of team-based performance. So we often assess the individual within the team, but do we assess the team dynamics well? And it emphasizes hierarchical progression. And we often think of medical school as the core education that we will need in order to learn how to be good physicians. And so we really think that leadership should be integrated into the medical school curriculum because the, um, the physicians of the 21st century really need to be able to learn how to do these things. And in a qualitative study, uh, physicians indicated that they would have liked or they felt that they needed training in all of the following departments. Quality assurance, clinical benchmarking, decision making, strategic planning, communication, organizational change, effective listening, and systems thinking. So up to now, we've discussed the need for physician leadership and physician leadership education. But increasingly, there's been a call for leadership education to begin in the medical school context, to begin in undergraduate uh, medical education. In 2004, O'Connell and Pisco said that there were insufficient explicit leadership curricula out there to train our students in effective leadership skills. Now, numerous medical schools are taking upon themselves the task of creating leadership uh, curricula that are in-house and training their students to take on leadership roles. So we've been talking about the importance of leadership training, specifically in the medical school context, but how does one actually go about creating an effective leadership curriculum? Uh, so here are a couple of lessons from the literature. 
Uh, the literature tells us that leadership training should be local or in-house, which is not necessarily intuitive. But in an article written by Schwartz, they say that private industry has shown repeatedly that leadership trainings are most effective if they're in-house, if they develop, if they rely on the internal development of leaders so that they can groom them within their own context um, and develop their skills within that specific context and then can go out to other contexts and affect change. Um, additionally, leadership interventions should be led by physicians uh, because they understand the clinical context and can act as role models for medical students. Um, additionally, we should increase, um, uh, we should include emotional intelligence competencies such as self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills, um, as well as increasing experiential learning and relying on simulations, role plays, faculty-led study groups, and case studies. Our educational interventions should be interactive, problem-based, include mentoring by physician leaders, and offer long-term instruction to maximize the gains. So one question that we asked ourselves, sorry, one question that we asked ourselves throughout this process is why you know, when deciding to implement a leadership curriculum to medical students, why choose to implement it as early as year one? The literature really doesn't, um, at, so far as we've seen, address this question. And so we thought, you know, as early as possible would be best, and we had a couple of reasons that we thought this was, this was important. So one, um, so we implemented it to rising second years at the end of their first year, and we know that the second year students at Mount Sinai often uh, carry a lot of the extracurricular responsibility um, within the student body, and hopefully developing these leadership skills early will help them to, you know, effectuate change and be better leaders within their student organizations as second years and beyond. Uh, the second reason is we thought, you know, a big, uh, we will tell you about this later, but a big message of our curriculum was not only leadership skill building, but mindfulness about leadership skills and mindfulness about how do you interact with others. And we thought that instilling these um, skills early would really encourage students to um, be mindful about their leadership journey and set them to, you know, set them up well for future leadership positions. And finally, as is expressed in the quote, um, you can really, you know, even if you're a year one medical student and you're so far removed from the clinical context, or uh, it can feel that you're far removed from the clinical context sometimes and far removed from physicianhood, uh, you can really be a leader and demonstrate leadership skills without being the leader of the group per se. So I'm going to read this quote, which I think uh, is really great. Uh, it, leadership is not restricted to people who hold designated leadership roles. Instead, leadership is shown through a shared sense of responsibility for the success of the organization and its services. Acts of leadership can come from anyone in the organization as appropriate at different times and are focused on the achievement of the group rather than of the individual. Therefore, shared leadership actively supports effective teamwork. This includes developing the personal qualities required to be an active team member, supporting others who are in leadership roles, and taking an active role in leadership when appropriate. So we really feel that you know, implementing the curriculum as early as possible, even to year one medical students, is uh, very effective. So the literature tells us about you know, some of the competencies that it feels that medical students should um, gain from leadership courses. So among them, among these skills are communication, conflict resolution, time management, negotiation, delegation, teamwork, and community service. And also, you know, to be given a general sense of the, the context of the healthcare system into which future physicians will be entering. And uh, to offer, finally, inspiration and development opportunities for those students who show uh, an interest at an early stage of their medical education. Um, and so a lot of these competencies from the literature you will see coming up in the competencies that we developed for our curriculum, which Esty will tell you about just now. So this is the competency framework that we basically relied on or adapted in order to build our own curriculum. And this is a competency framework built in the UK by the National Health Service Institute for Innovation and Improvement and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And we chose this framework because it's been extensively researched uh, and extensively applied to leadership interventions, as well it can also be applicable to the year one medical school context. And so what we did was we actually chose three of the competencies expressed in this framework and emphasized them as uh, pillars of our own competencies for our curriculum um, because they could be applied to the year one context. So we uh, emphasized personal qualities, working with others, and setting direction. And improving and managing services we felt were a little bit more advanced skills, and we're actually going to implement them in a future iteration 
um, which we'll discuss to you. At, we'll discuss with you at the end. So here you can see how our how these uh, competency frameworks uh, got integrated into our own competencies for our curriculum. Personal qualities for our for our participants. They will be introspective, self-aware leaders who understand the dynamics of the healthcare system and how they can contribute to it. Working with others. Our participants will be proficient in communication, conflict resolu uh, resolution, and negotiation skills, and will value these skills as important. The third competency, setting directions. Our participants will feel confident in their leadership skills and will accept opportunities for application of these skills in the wards and beyond. So how does this really translate into our curriculum? So finally, we get a chance to introduce you to the five modules of our curriculum. And we expanded those three competencies into five modules. The first module, Leadership in the 21st Century, introduces students to multidisciplinary patient-focused care and introduces them to the importance of leadership within the 21st century. Session two, You as a Leader, encourages students to think about their own personal leadership styles, their strengths and weaknesses, and personal barriers to effective leadership. And together, the first two modules comprise the personal qualities aspect of the competency framework. Session three, communication and cooperation, introduces students to interprofessional coalition building and the fundamentals of teamwork. Session four, negotiation and conflict management, how to manage differences of priority and opinion. And together, sessions three and four essentially comprise the working with others aspect of the NHS competency model. Session five, today's and tomorrow's leaders, encourages students to apply these leadership techniques to the medical school context and beyond, and to begin to formulate statements of vision and mission. And that comprises the setting direction aspect of the competency framework. So in terms of how we went about designing our curriculum, so as Esty said, there are five modules. Each module ended up being an hour and a half long over the course of about a week. Um, and the, the each module was de designed and facilitated by one team, so a medical student, so either Esty or myself, uh, a physician, and a non-physician partner in healthcare. Um, and we thought that this modeled pretty well the, the interprofessional collaboration that we're trying to teach about and also sort of expose the students to. Um, and each uh, module incorporated formal didactics, case-based learning, and small group discussion, which are all modalities that medical students are familiar with. So here, just to give you a sense of our faculty, we'll mention people by name as we uh, describe each module. But we had a really, we thought we had an amazing faculty teaching. So the, the curriculum developers were um, Shashi Anand, Dr. Karani, uh, SDN, myself. And if you'll notice, um, we really tried to make sure there was a range of backgrounds, uh, in, like backgrounds in healthcare teaching the curriculum. So we had MDs, we had a PhD in organizational psychology, we had a social worker, a nurse practitioner, um, we had administrators in healthcare, and we really felt that that was a key component to like making you know making the curriculum successful. Uh, and additionally, uh, after everybody had, each individual team had finished designing their module, we had a faculty development session where we brought all of the faculty together in one room, and they were able to present their module to all of the other faculty, teaching all of the other modules to give them a good sense of how their module fit into the overarching curriculum as a whole and, you know, contributing to the unity of the feeling of the curriculum to the students. Um, in terms of curricular implementation, so how, you know, who part took in terms of our students and how did we choose them. So it was a little bit of a self-selecting group of students. People, uh, we had students apply and write a two to three hundred word response to the following question. Why do you want to participate in this program? How will the skills and knowledge reinforced in this curriculum contribute to your leadership development? Is there a cause or project to which you intend to apply them? So we really um, encouraged students to reflect on the particular skills they wanted to learn and how, you know, how specifically were they going to apply these skills? And our, our curriculum was really like, action-focused. Um, and you know, 
trying to encourage them to reflect on what they were going to learn and how they were going to apply it. And actually, interestingly, at the end of the course, we gave them back their um, application question, the, the response that they wrote, and encouraged them to develop it further based on the skills they felt that they had developed during the leadership session. Uh, and how were they going to move forward with what they had learned. Um, so ultimately, we came up with a pilot cohort of 16 rising second years. And the five modules were uh, given or delivered during the bench to bedside week last year. OK, so at this point, we're going to sort of take you through um, and describe each module in a little bit more detail to give you a sense of what we taught. Um, so the first module, as we said before, was developed by Dr. Karani, Shashi, Esti, and myself. Uh, and the, the, the module was entitled The Charge and Challenge of Leadership in the 21st Century. And it was really designed to introduce students to the fundamentals of leadership and give them a sense of why leadership in healthcare, why now, why should physicians be leaders? So we started, we did not give the students any pre-assignment. We wanted to get them fresh without being influenced by, you know, maybe some of the terms or the concepts in the literature. And we wanted to get a sense for what they felt leadership was. So they came in and they worked on a reflective assignment. What does leadership mean to you? And each student was asked to designate one person that they felt um, in, embodied the uh, theories that they had of leadership um, and why did they feel like this person was a leader. And the students um, sort of individually uh, gave, who, you know, gave a little presentation on adjectives they thought described them and uh, what made up a good leader. Uh, and then as a group, you know, we broke the students up into small group and as a group, each group came up with a definition of leadership that they then shared with the class. After this small group activity, we had a didactic lecture delivered by Dr. Crani. Um, about the need for leadership in medicine. And so Dr. Crani really uh, took them from healthcare at the ground level. So, you know, talking about the challenges and also opportunities facing the healthcare system uh, this year, uh, right now, I guess, uh, healthcare tomorrow. So, looking forward to necessary changes uh, in the healthcare system, talking about physician leadership. Um, what are the opportunities that physicians have for leadership? Why are physicians good? candidates to be leaders within the healthcare system and agents of change within the healthcare system? And uh, what are some of the barriers that physicians have to being leadership within this system? And finally, um, we also talked about the theory sort of, of transformative learning. So what this curriculum and seminar was supposed to be was, you know, building leadership attributes to then create people who were going to go and change and act on those leadership skills and act on a vision and a mission that they were able to implement. After the session, students were asked to uh, read uh, two articles. So one article was Turning Doctors into Leaders, which uh, rehashes some of the same ideas that Dr. Crani presented in her talk, uh, talking about a new kind of le uh, need for a new kind of leadership in the healthcare system, uh, the notion that performance matters, and the, the notion that value is not a bad word in today's healthcare system, how to build effective teams, and how to articulate visions and values. And the other article that students were asked to read was by Daniel Goleman. Uh, it was called Leadership That Gets Results. And it was a little bit more of a transitional reading into the second module, which was about leadership styles. So this module, this article, sorry, talked about um, what are the components of emotional intelligence? What are some different leadership styles as delineated by the author of the article? And what are some of the concepts that he lays out for climate in the workplace? The second module was entitled You as a Leader, and it was supposed to be an exploration of leadership styles. Um, and so the students were ho hopefully developed an understanding of wh what their leadership style was, how does this leadership style interact with other people's leadership style, and what can they work on? What are the potential challenges of this leadership style? So we had a didactic lecture. So this, um, sorry, this module was designed and facilitated by Dr. David Thomas. Um, and Dr. Michel Bouffet, who is not a Sinai uh, faculty member, he has a PhD in organizational psychology and actually works in uh, consulting for uh, various pharmaceutical companies and other companies. And so he first delivered a lecture uh, giving an overview of leadership concepts and theories. So he defined leadership, and then he defined leadership as it differs from management. So he, his angle on it was more that, you know, leadership is about influencing people, so they will strive willingly towards an ach the achievement of a group of goals. So leadership is more about aligning people versus management, which is more about how to get things done. Um, and so 
he talked about how do you balance concern for production versus concern for people. And he also talked about the different factors affecting leadership style. And uh, the second part of the presentation was helping students to figure out what was their dominant leadership style. So he actually used a model called the DISC model. Um, if you can see on, on the, um, here on the presentation, there is a little DISC with a D-I-C. And so each quadrant rep represents a dominant leadership style with specific qualities. So for example, I mean, I won't go through all of them, but one example would be the conscientious model uh, leadership style. So that would be an analytical, reserved, precise, private, and systematic kind of person. I think we had a lot of those among the medical student population. Um, <laughs> but so basically, he administered an abbreviated version of a personality, sort of a personality test, where students were shown 10 slides, and each slide had a series of adjectives on it, and they would choose which adjective most uh, best defined them. And then based on that, they could see where they fell uh, on this disk. And so they were either completely within one quadrant, or maybe they were between two quadrant and had you know, co-dominant leadership styles. And so we discussed in detail for each leadership style, what are the, the advantages of this leadership style? What are some of the challenges that you might have with this leadership style? And how does your leadership style interact with other people's leadership style. And so what should you be aware of when interacting with people? Um, he also talked about how, you know, obviously the leadership style you take may be leadership, uh, may be situation dependent. So you may have to change leadership styles from one situation to, an, to the next. And he really emphasized that these, these leadership styles, as we call them, are more about, they're not really about labeling, they're more about understanding, right? How, how do you create a framework to understand how you interact with people and how can you improve upon that? Um, Finally, uh, Dr. Buffet talked about leadership and decision making. So he gave us a way sort of, of how to organize all the different contributing factors when making decisions as a leader. How do you decide how to go about solving problems? And in that vein, we then um, did a couple of case studies where we, the students were presented with problems that they may confront in their, in their lifetime. And they were, you know, as a group, they worked through the problem. So uh, one example was, you know, you have a practice and there are two parking spots left uh, available for four people who want the parking spot. And your practice has tried to minimize the difference in hierarchy between um, the different people working there. And so how do you go about solving that problem? What kind of approach do you take? Uh, another one was about, you know, you angered a referring physician to your practice. And how do you then appease both parts of the argument? You know, how do you go about listening to all the different sides of the story and then taking action that would best fit the situation? Um, so we, we worked through a, a series of case studies all together. Um, and the end of, uh, at, during the second half of the session, Dr. David Thomas actually gave the physician leader's perspective on all of these uh, theories. So a lot of this talk about leadership styles may seem a little bit um, theoretical to some people. So we thought it would be good to bring, bring it back down to earth, bring it back down to the clinical context for, um, and listen to somebody's experience who the students may be able to relate with a little bit better. So Dr. Thomas delivered really, um, a very um, insightful uh, talk about his trajectory in academic medicine, um, about founding EHOP, and about how um, he made the decisions he made, what, what, what was his understanding of his trajectory relative to his own leadership styles, how, do, how does he feel his uh, leadership styles interacted with other people's, and um, how do you find people to work with who really complement your leadership style. And he also emphasized that you have to be aware of what really motivates you as a person in order to um, finally be a leader. You really have to do what you care about. So that, I think the students, they really responded very well to Dr. Thomas's presentation. And I think all of the students wished that there had been a little more time in the session to continue the discussion. Um, and as a post work for the session, students were asked to sort of you know, consolidate what we had said about their leadership style and uh, fill out an action plan. You know, what are you good at? answering these questions. So what are you good at? What do you need to work on? And what actions are you going to take um, in order to develop these skills? And uh, also, one question was, what kind of mentor um, are you looking for? Who do you think can teach you these skills? So that was something that we thought medical students could benefit from, was thinking about leadership styles in the context of finding a mentor. The third session uh, was about communication and multidisciplinary cooperation. It was designed and facilitated by Dr. Trulio, um, Bambi Fisher, and Marjorie Salas, uh, and myself. And so the beginning of this module, uh, of this module began with sort of revisiting some of 
what we had learned in the first two modules. And then we had a teamwork exercise. So this was really about thinking about team dynamics. So each, uh, the students were divided into groups. Each group was given some paper and some tape and told, build the tallest tower in 10 minutes. And the group who builds the tallest tower wins. So we started the 10 minutes. And then five minutes in, we switched the groups around. So we took one member of each group and moved them to another group. So we thought that this was really interesting to get the students to thinking about how much you know, one person can change a dynamic of a group. And also, you know, it's really similar to what happens in the clinical setting when you have people joining and leaving groups all the time. Um, after that, uh, Dr. Trulio delivered a didactic on the fundamentals of teamwork and talked a little bit about what are the stages of team formation. I actually heard a student last week um, talk about their, the stage of the team formation of their ASM group, and so I'm happy to hear that that stuck with them. Um, what are the characteristics of effective teams? What can be the barriers to good teamwork? Um, what are some effective communication strategies? So, for example, we taught them the SBAR technique. Um, where how, you know, when you're presenting a patient to another physician, we actually added an I, so it's the ISBAR technique for introduction. We emphasize that you should always tell people who you are um, when, when speaking to them, especially as a medical student, defining your role. Um, and we had several role plays that revolved around practicing communication. Um, we had some case studies where we, you know, gave examples of one clinical situation with teamwork gone wrong and analyzing a little bit what went wrong in that situation. And finally, to bring it back to the first year experience, we had a finding your role um, case study, which was about an LCE uh, situation where the, the student had to find their place within the LCE sort of um, patient care team. So for session four, negotiation and conflict resolution, the art and science of resolving differences, uh, we had Dr. Peter Gliato and Phyllis Schneff and myself work and develop and implement it. Um, and the session began with a pre-assignment where students were assigned uh, the task of thinking about a conflict or a potential conflict they had with a colleague or a superior in the past year. And they had to answer questions eliciting their seat of mind and thinking about what the other individual in that conflict was thinking about as well. Um, and then we debriefed by having one student actually share her own experience in that conflict. And then other students uh, were able to voice the opportunity, or had the opportunity to voice what they felt could have prevented the conflict, could have made the conflict a little bit more productive, a little bit more about what the other party might have been thinking, and kind of elicit some of the strategies that you have listed over here that we uh, kind of came up with that emerged from that story. Uh, then we had two role plays. One was about interpersonal conflict and the other one was about negotiation. And we specifically wanted these uh, role plays to be very applicable to the year one context. Um, so for the interpersonal uh, conflict, we had two students um, who received a prompt um, about a conflict over TAing physiology. Um, and each one got a prompt from their own perspective, from that party's own perspective. And another student in that group was assigned the role of the observer and received information from both of the parties, kind of as the omniscient uh, person within that triad. And then the students engaged in trying to figure out how to elicit the other's state of mind, how to separate impact from intent, uh, differentiating between positions and interest, and maintaining relationships while resolving conflict. Uh, in our second role play, we uh, tried to have the students elicit negotiation techniques. So again, keeping it real to the year one context, we had students, essentially, one student was asking the other one for funding. One was, sorry, one was a treasurer and student council, and the other one had to petition for funding for their student group. And again, we had another one in the observer position who kind of watched this dynamic unfold. Um, and we hoped from this session, uh, from that specific role play, that the students learned how to demonstrate how to be creative about potential solutions to negotiation um, and to identify the importance of a reference standard when negotiating. So figuring out how they're going to come to some sort of understanding or appropriate negotiation while, again, maintaining the relationship between these two students. Um, and so all of these skills that we had elicited during the debrief and during the role plays were then reinforced in a didactic session led by Dr. Gliato, where he spoke about uh, effectively managing conflict and, successfully, and successful negotiation. And those are both informed by books Getting to Yes and Difficult Conversations. Um, and then we spoke about the relevance of both of these 
um, both of these skills. In describing how physicians utilize these skills of conflict resolution and negotiation in their everyday work. Um, and the module finished with a worksheet where the students were encouraged to revisit the conflict that they had outlined at the beginning of the session um, and think about, in light of all of the things that they had learned, how they could have done it better. Session five, Today's and Tomorrow's Leaders, the Roles, Opportunities, and Challenges of Medical Students in the Healthcare System, was designed and facilitated by uh, Dean Muller, by Dr. Teresa Soriano, and myself. And in this, we really wanted students to get a chance to reflect on their role, their leadership role currently, and to look beyond their immediate context and to think about what opportunities they have for exerting an impact and an influence on our community and on healthcare and beyond. Um, and so we introduced the concepts of vision and mission in this module. For those of you who are not familiar with these concepts or with these terms, a vision statement articulates a person's or an organization's values, their reason for being, and, um, and what one hopes to achieve. Whereas a vision, uh, sorry, a mission statement defines the actions that the person or organization will take to achieve that mission, um, and specifically delineates those. Um, so for the pre-work, we had students articulate their values. They uh, responded to a three-question prompt um, that helped them then formulate a tentative vision statement. Uh, we then debriefed about that in a small group discussion um, where students got the opportunity to share the answers to those questions with the group. Um, and they began to talk about the applications of those visions into what we would call missions to their specific organizations, either in Sinai or, or outside of Sinai, um, which was followed by a didactic session, uh, differentiating or formally differentiating vision and mission statements, um, and then providing examples of visions and missions from organizations that students were familiar with, for example, Mount Sinai. Um, and then finally culminating in um, the Visiting Docs uh, mission statement, um, which was particularly interesting because both Dean Muller and Dr. Soriano um, have been involved in Visiting Docs, and both of them got the opportunity to share their own personal visions and how those kind of coalesced into one mission. Uh, that of visiting docs. And what we emphasize is that individuals can have many visions and those can be tied to many missions over the course of their career. Um, and also both of them uh, emphasize that their, leaders, their own leadership journeys were not linear. Um, but it is important to have some sort of mindfulness, uh, even starting as at the beginning of medical school, about the way that your vision you hope that your vision will unfold, being mindful about what your vision is and the impact that you hope to have on the face of healthcare. Uh, finally, we had the students um, rework their vision and mission, similar to Module 4, in light of what they had learned in Module 5. Um, and then finally, Dean Muller closed the loop, um, emphasizing all of the modules and picking out the salient points from Modules 1 to 5 so that the students could uh, really grasp what it is that they had gotten and reflect upon what they had gotten for the for the five modules. So up to now we have spoken about the literature behind the curriculum um, and also the curriculum itself. So now we're going to talk to you, we're going to shift gears a little bit to, about the assessment of the curriculum, how we actually um, analyzed how successful the curriculum was. So we delivered a pre-course content quiz um, at the beginning of the course and then compared that to a content quiz, the same content quiz delivered at the end of the course. Um, we also at the end of the course delivered a, uh, at, um, an attitudinal survey that compared the students' um, answers to questions about attitudes and confidence and skills from the beginning of the course to the end. Um, and then we also relied on quantitative and qualitative data from the course evaluation. So I'm going to walk you through the cognitive assessment results. Um, so we compared the scores, as I said, pre and post on a 17 question um, quiz. And you'll see all the participant numbers there. There were 13 students who completed the exam. Um, the mean score at the beginning of the exam was 73% correct. And at the end of the exam, uh, sorry, at the, exam, at the end of the curriculum, at the end of the uh, elective, the mean score was 81%. So it was a gross jump 
Um, and you can see that all of the uh, participants' scores improved except for one student. Um, and then we, again, analyzed the data by, um, by question number, but I'm actually going to skip this slide. You can know it's there. And we basically used this to uh, analyze what was most effective within the curriculum. But again, I'm going to skip it just for time's sake. Um, and then we analyzed how effective each session was by breaking up the questions um, into where it was taught. Um, and basically, just to not go into too much detail, the overall uh, impression was that essentially they were all fairly effective in teaching and there wasn't necessarily a differential, it wasn't good at picking up the differential success. But we can go into more, more details if you have more questions about that later. So the second part of the assessment component of the curriculum is an attitudinal assessment. So <clears throat> at the end of the curriculum, students were presented with, I think, 18 statements and to which they had to agree or disagree on a scale of one to seven. So one or to two being strongly disagree, and then six to seven being strongly agree. Um, and the way, the way we decided to sort of interpret the data and try to get something meaningful out of it was we looked at the shift of students who did not strongly agree to strongly agree at the end. So, you know, did they not strongly agree to a certain statement post, and then did they strongly agree at the end? Um, so just before I talk about that in more detail, before the course, uh, with an average of 2.8 out of 7, most students disagreed and said that they had, so they thought that they did not have sufficient training and leadership before taking the course. And then after taking the course, all students strongly agreed that they thought that they needed more leadership training. Um, and so in terms of, I told you it was 18, 18 statements that they were then going to evaluate. Um, and right, so they evaluated how they felt before the course and how they felt after the course. And so we grouped these statements into different overarching sort of different themed groups. So one group of statement was about attitude. Um, so attitudes towards the importance of leadership. So do they find leadership important? Do they find leadership development important? Do they find self-reflection important as a component of leadership? And do they find teamwork as important in the component of leadership? And then we uh, looked at that data averaged um, and then the second theme that we looked at was confidence. So do they feel, there was a statement, you know, do you feel confident in your leadership skills and abilities? Um, and so we looked at that and confidence in teamwork and negotiation skills. And the third group, the thematic group of statements was about action plan. So did the students understand where to focus their leadership abilities pre and post the course? And did they have intent for involvement in community advocacy and student organizations? And I'm gonna take you through it in a little bit more detail. Um, and we'll talk about sort of the most salient results. So uh, in terms of uh, attitudes towards the importance of leadership, leadership development, self-reflection and teamwork, um, it was already very high before the course. It was already 90% um, of students strongly agreed that all of these things were important. And on the right here are some of the sample statements. In the interest of time, I won't take you through them, but if you're interested in reading them, you may. Um, and after taking the course, 97% of students strongly agreed. So there was a slight increase, um, but the non-dramatic increase probably is accounted for by the fact that it was already very high before the course. Of note, 36% um, of the students increased their rating of the importance of self-reflection in leadership. So um, given our curriculum's emphasis on mindfulness, we thought that was um, a success. Um, in terms of confidence, so students were asked, you know, do you feel, I feel confident in my leadership skills. And before the curriculum, uh, only 36% of students strongly agreed, and after the curriculum, 63% um, of students agreed. So we saw a 27% increase. Um, and in terms of confidence in their teamwork and negotiation skills, before the curriculum, 36% strongly agreed, up to 75% after the curriculum. So that was a 39% increase. And of note, 72% um, of students increased um, by at least one point in the, their confidence in their ability to have difficult conversations with colleagues. And 72% of students increase in their confidence in their ability to negotiate on behalf of themselves and their patients. And finally, in terms of action plan, um, before the course, 27% of students strongly agreed that they uh, felt that they knew where to focus their leadership abilities. And after the course, 63% strongly agreed. So that was a 36% increase. And we saw a 9% increase in their intent for involvement with uh, community advocacy and student organizations. And again, we attribute that relatively small increase to the fact that it was already pretty high to begin with. It was already 81%. Um, and these, this is a self-selecting group of students who probably were already very involved in student organizations. So 
um, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a good positive to have. Um, so, you know, as a summary, um, the, the largest increases that we saw were in the students' confidence in their abilities to, uh, in their leadership skills and their negotiation skills and their teamwork skills, as well as their um, understanding of where to focus their leadership skills. Uh, and the last modality we used to analyze the success of the curriculum was the students' quantitative and qualitative feedback. Uh, so all of the students rated the elective as superior or very good. Um, and they also rated the overall organization of the elective, quality of teaching, clarity of the objectives as either superior or very good. And all of the modules were very highly rated individually with module five scoring, scoring the highest. Congratulations. Um, so for uh, some of the more uh, qualitative data, students said, or one student said, this was by far the most influential and perspective changing elective I've taken this year. Uh, other students comment that the course was very well organized. Uh, weaknesses, some of the session were too uh, lecture heavy. And then my favorite weakness, I wish this course was longer. <laughs> I felt we only got to hit the highlights. So that's basically what everyone, every curriculum developer hopes to hear as a weakness for their course. Um, in terms of the suggestions for improvement, some of the themes that emerged was that students wish that the sessions were longer, about two hours. Um, some were split between whether they wanted um, the course to be more spread out over, in t uh, over time or a more intensive. Uh, students suggested more focus on the readings, uh, fewer didactics, and an advanced course to really uh, help them develop this into the future. Uh, so this slide basically details some of the uh, lessons from the literature that we incorporated into our program and some of the things that were unique to our program that we hope to contribute to the literature. Um, so first of all, we, as literature prescribes, we developed a local in-house program led by physicians, including uh, emotional intelligence competencies uh, with a lot of simulation, role play, um, uh, case studies, and um, uh, study groups um, that was interactive, problem-based, and included mentoring by physician leaders. Uh, the one prescription that we didn't meet at this time was offering long-term instruction, and that's something that we hope to do in the future. Uh, some of the things that we added to the literature and some of the things that were novel about our curriculum um, was, uh, as Virginie said, our very interesting design. We had a design um, that included medical students, uh, physicians, non-physician partners in healthcare and medical education. And that was something that you know, we hope to model uh, for our students and something that we believe is very important and one of the really fundamental aspects of our design. Uh, we also included cognitive, affective, and skill-based competencies. Um, and this, to our knowledge, is also the earliest uh, leadership intervention course within medical school um, that's been presented in the literature. Um, additionally, the interprofessional interdisciplinary design, where we took uh, data from Harvard Business uh, Review, uh, review um, from psychology literature, and really incorporated all of that into our medical school leadership training. Um, and additionally, we really tried to emphasize the importance of personal reflection and mindfulness throughout the journey, and that was something that is unique to our curriculum. Uh, so really quickly, just in terms of some of the future directions that we see this leadership curriculum taking, we are going to continue to offer this elective for the next cohort of year one medical students. We're actually going to offer it um, during the In Focus week um, in second semester in January. Um, we are hoping to pilot a modified version of this curriculum to a larger cohort to see how, um, how it does with a larger uh, group of students. And finally, we are hoping uh, and working on developing a, an advanced leadership skills curriculum that we would pilot to fourth year medical students. Um, with the two additional competencies from the competency framework that we showed you before, um, which are managing services and improving services, um, which we felt were, as Esty said before, a little bit more advanced. And um, uh, if you would like to contact us, you should feel free to email us. Um, and thank you so much again to all the faculty who devoted countless hours to making this curriculum happen. Um, we really feel that, you know, it wouldn't have happened without all of the work of every single person in, in the team. So thank you so much.
questions.